Hello everyone, thanks for coming out today. Uh, I am Marcus Thomas, I'm Chair of Music and Performing Arts Management at the Hart School, and it is my extreme pleasure to welcome you out to the Hart School Celebration Part 100 Beyond Performance, Diversity in Arts in Action. Uh, this week-long celebration brings together four celebrated composers from all over the United States and four engaging presenters as well. The Heart Wind Ensemble, Symphony Band, and Orchestra will present two concerts of exciting music featuring our guest composers. Together with our guest presenters, there will be six thought-provoking lectures and panel discussions examining artistic and social devices our composers and presenters have used to move beyond performance and talk into measurable action that has positively impacted the lives of countless people who engage in and with the performing arts. Our esteemed guests are among the brightest and most genuine talent in the contemporary performing arts scene. They are performers who build bridges to connect the performing arts to new and diverse audiences. They are composers who craft longer tables to make room for a plurality of voices. They are executives who open doors for a new generation of creatives to develop their businesses. And they are educators who open windows for aspiring students to chase their dreams. It is my pleasure today to welcome uh, to you Mr. Colton Harris. Colton Harris is a creative visionary leader, educator, facilitator, and multidisciplinary artist, currently serving as a program manager at the Connecticut Office of the Arts. In his role, he is charged with the mission to design programs and experiences that empower artists and demonstrate the centrality of the arts to the human experience. He spent years working with youth as the artistic and executive director of a social justice youth theater while also instructing educators and theater practitioners in his method of devising new works of theater uh, that center on community engagement and development. As a recording artist, producer, and musician, he has created a growing body of work that sonically explores dreamlike landscapes with timeless messages in both lyrical and visual presentation. He's also a director, actor, and writer whose mission is to inspire the artist in every human being by telling powerful stories that can shift culture towards a posture of innovation and forward thinking. It is my pleasure to present Mr. Colton Harris, our speaker for the day. Thank you so much for that introduction. and Thank you for allowing me to be here. I'm really excited about our conversation today. It's my understanding that this room is filled both virtually and here with folks coming from different perspectives. So it's my hope that as we engage in conversation, I'll set the framework for what can be a really engaging dialogue. And hopefully you walk away with even just a little nugget of inspiration or insight to be able to apply it to your own life, your own work, regardless of your vantage point. So are you ready to dive in? Yeah. Amazing. OK, so before we get into the topic at hand, I wanted to kind of set the grounds and the framework for our conversation and kind of give you a little bit more insight of where I'm coming from, who I am, and what I hope to achieve in our time together today. So you heard of the expression stream of consciousness, right? And today what I really would like to engage with you is this stream of action-oriented consciousness. So that these ideas, these frameworks, these thoughts are going to seem at times lofty and conceptual, but we'll always aim to take them from concept to applicability. And that's really the goal today, to wrestle with ideas and concepts and to kind of propose to you my point of view. I don't necessarily think I'm right about everything, but I do believe that I have a point of view. And hopefully engaging with your point of view, whether you're here or you're watching, you can start to dissect ways that you can potentially apply these concepts into actions, whether as a student, as a practitioner of art, or even as an administrator, organizer, whatever your role may be, maybe even as a better family member and friend, because we can all grow in those ways as well. So this is my sort of case for why we're going to be talking in this part of our conversation around ideas and the conception. So there's levels to this, and when we're talking about diversity in arts and in action, there are these four eyes of oppression. When we think about the reality that regardless of where you come from, circumstance, situation, and background. A lot of folks, I would argue, every person in some way, shape, or form is oppressed. Mentally, emotionally, structurally, there's oppression present in our human experience. And I believe that when we look at these four eyes of oppression, that there's also a way to look at these levels as a way to make the case for transformation. 
So I want to keep them both in context and walk us through them because it's really going to set the grounds of what I want to share with you today. So the first level, the first I, is ideological. And this is how we think about the world. How we perceive not only reality, but society, what things we give value to, who we give value to. And the ideological is almost our end goal. And then that leads us to build the world around us. And that's when we talk about institutional practices, policies, procedures. They are informed by our ideological values. How I value you as a human being or what we value as an organization, institution, family, whatever that looks like, you start to build out an institution. So when we're talking about addressing institutional or structural change, we have to think about first how we think about the world. And then this interpersonal level of how we engage community. It's important for us to think about now that I'm in an institution, whatever institution that is, family institution, I'm in a band, I'm a part of a label, I run a nonprofit. This institutional is really made to come alive in, in the interpersonal, how I relate to others around. But those institutional practices oftentimes inform the ways in which we relate with one another. This is where power dynamics come into play. You can take two human beings, one may be older than the other, but once you add a label of teacher and student, the interpersonal connectivity is now informed by this ideology and the practice, which is why all of us at some point maybe had that experience to where you relate to your teacher outside of the building, and you're like, wow, that's pretty cool. <laughs> I'm like, oh, I get it. You're a human being too, but this structure causes me to now assimilate to a particular way of being. And lastly, internal, how we care for self. So these four eyes work together and they build up into this internal experience. How we collectively think informs how we build, how we engage with one another, and then how we relate to or care for ourselves which is why you hear the, the concept of internalized racism. But I would like to take these four eyes and propose that it's not just through a lens of oppression that we can understand how to transform, that we need action and diversity in our institutions, in our spaces, in ourselves, in the ways in which we build and create. So why not use the same framework that we've used to break down to oppress and to harm and use it in the other way, in a subversive way. So let's use that. And so my title today, you don't have to remember it, you don't have to think it's gonna be a test or a quiz. I don't know, maybe. We'll do a quiz at the end, I'm kidding. Designing ecosystems for transformation and now generation work. And we're gonna break down these concepts and these, these ideas because it's, it's really important to me that we think about ourselves as individuals, as designers in different Regardless of your vocation and your experience, you are a designer. You design, you curate, you make things in different ways, whether they're musically, but also even in your relationships. Every day you wake up, you dress a certain way because you're trying to curate and design a response from the people around you. If I dress this way, I respond this way, then I can get this and this and that. And I believe that as human beings, which I'll talk about in a little bit, we are really agricultural at our core but we function in a lot of industrial-based systems, which really contradicts our true nature. And so the reason why I want to evoke the image of ecosystems is because I want you to feel the liveliness of the ways in which we relate to one another. And ultimately, one of my goals and what I think we all need and can benefit from is transformation. There's harm, brokenness, decay in our systems and our nation and our institutions and ourselves and so how do we transform how do we heal how do we help and this expression now generation is really rooted and anchored in this idea that in the institutional educational spaces like this and even earlier in life you always told me you're the future you're the future and then you wake up one day and you're like wait a second when is the future the future is constantly happening the past is quickly away we're already in the future so it's really about what are we doing now and how do we create transformation and power now. 
And so hopefully by the end of this, you feel inspired and you take a nugget from something to be able to make change now from where you are with what you do and think about who you are in accordance with that. So coming to be a little bit about my story and I want to categorize it through these three particular lenses of closed doors, unlikely pathways, and being human. My introduction into the arts really stemmed from childhood. I'm an only child, so I grew up having to find ways to, when I was not at school, entertain myself. And that was through art and expression and through, you know, running around um, with a shirt on my head and in my underwear as Tarzan some character like that. And it was cute until I was 15. <laughs> and we had neighbors come over and that wasn't appropriate. Right, so I had to grow up. But truthfully, a lot of my institutional experiences with art really make where I am today and what I'm doing in the short amount of time that I've lived really remarkable to me. I wake up every day and I'm like, wow, I'm actually doing this. I'm actually making art. I'm actually helping people in this way and that way I'm able to create because a lot of my introduction to artistic creative practices was actually through closed doors, a lot of discrimination. Theater programs that really saw my presence as an intrusion, that saw my skin as an error, right? Not being able to audition for certain roles or to participate in certain things because of how I looked or where I came from. And the stereotypes and assumptions that were really clothing me when I was in these spaces. So I was always told verbally, non-verbally, and in between that you can't do that. But that's not for you, or we don't want you here. We don't need you here. So a lot of my experience was really through closed doors, not being able to join things or be a part of them. And so that led me down these unlikely pathways to how I got here now. If you were to ask some of my teachers throughout school, a lot of them would be really surprised. I don't, I don't know how we got to there. I didn't see that coming. Was it that I really had no potential? Was it really that I was inadequate? Was it really that I had nothing to give? No, that's not one of those narratives. I think we, we push those too much. It's like, oh yeah, so unlikely for me to be here because I'm. I'm not anything. No, I, I had all of these things. But when you're in toxic environments that hinder stimulation and creative thinking, anyone that's not fitting into our institutional lines is seen as an error or a glitch. So I was a glitch. And that was okay. Because ultimately, the goal was for me to find my humanity. And so my art, my creativity, was nurtured and cultivated in unorthodox ways around unorthodox people that didn't necessarily fit into particular molds or spaces. And so I had to find my way in community. So I use the term ecosystem. So when we think about ecosystem, we're talking about environment. And I really want us to focus on environment today. And it's a community or group of living organisms that live in and interact with each other in a specific environment. What we're talking about diversity in arts and action. What we're really talking about is how do we create an ecosystem? And I would argue that a lot of our communities, whether they be educational communities, families, other spaces, are not composed of living organisms. A lot of people are metaphorically dead. Why? Because our ideological frameworks, the way we think about the world, has been skewed, and so it causes us to build things that actually suck the life out of people. Our in educational institutions start sucking the life out of ambition, out of dreams, out of the imagination. So therefore, now, you're not always conscious of who you are. So our ecosystems don't look alive, they look dull. And then our interactions with one another, by default, two broken, hurting, dying things interacting with each other. Now we're fighting for survival. Because in these spaces, we're also taught that, okay, there's a person next to you that you gotta worry about. You gotta fight against this person or compete with this person, that person. Even small things that are major implications, right? Grading systems. 
what'd you get on the test versus what I got? Comparison. Okay. So healthy ecosystems require energy, nutrients, water, oxygen, and living organisms. So we're going to design healthy ecosystems in your homes, in your community spaces, in your environments, or whatever you want to do, the company you may start, the organization you may run or work for, how do you build healthy ecosystems? You have to think about what kind of energy is there. And we're going to talk practically about how to assess and figure out how to design spaces that have particular energy. Sometimes we feel like we don't have that much autonomy or power as human beings to actually design and engineer spaces in particular ways, but we do. Architects, painters, colors, we know all of these ideas, but we never apply them. And we wonder why everyone feels so dull. The nutrients that we need, what does that look like? Water in a metaphorical sense, oxygen, and living organisms. So. When I'm talking about environment and ecosystems, I'm talking about the culture of a thing, a culture of a space, a culture of people. And what does it look like to think deeply about what kind of culture am I creating in the environments that I'm in? And so I charge you today to think about all of the spaces you occupy, your families, your schools, your communities, whatever you do, the sports teams you play on, whatever that may look like. Understand the culture. What's the DNA of that culture? And oftentimes we have to go from understanding to reimagining because our cultures are often really toxic. We have a lot of ideologies that we, that we live by, a lot of traditions and thought processes that we just continue to regurgitate because it was the way that it was always done. And we start to impose that, right? I had a friend in school who didn't like one of our teachers. They were like, I'll never be that teacher because I want to be a teacher one day and I never want to be that teacher. I'm here to report to you today, she is that teacher. <laughs> right? Same vibes. I'm like, whoa, you transform. You have that attitude, you're talking to students that way, you're doing this, you're doing that. I could blame her, but I could also think, wait, there's something about this environment, this culture. This culture is powerful. And if everybody's doing it, as independent as we think we are, more often than not, you go with the culture. That's why there's very few that push against. But I'm not just encouraging you to push against culture. I'm saying let's design it in a different way. Let's steward it in a different way. Let's reimagine it. And so the question is, who do you want to be? Having a vision for the environment, the spaces, and the culture. So when we're talking about diversity in arts and in action, a lot of times people are talking today about these concepts of inclusion and advocacy and all this stuff, but with no vision. What does it look like to have a diverse space? And to genuinely be honest about what that looks like instead of just using the jargon because it sounds right. Oh, we want diverse experiences. Like, yeah, feels great. But there's no vision. So you don't really know what that means or what that looks like. And it's a lot more attainable than you think. So what has been the norm? A lot of our spaces have been about humans dehumanizing humans. A lot of the institutions that we build, the reason why we, we fight so hard against this idea of oppression is because I believe that to be human is a beautiful thing, and a dignified thing, but our systems sometimes start to dehumanize them. So when that educator or when that person is fitting into and creating policies, procedures, rules, culture that causes the individuals in the room to be disconnected. Because the beauty of diversity is that it's about individuality with the unity. Right? Diversity is not about getting rid of all individuality. But it's also not about hyper-individuality. That there's still something communal about who we need to be. But how do we take some time to be honest and assess practical things as an example? An educational space because I think it's one of the easier ones to kind of point out. If you, I don't know about your school experience, but some people in elementary, high school, things like that, you're told a lot like stop talking to your friends, right? Or during lunch, lunch is like really short time, don't get up, don't move around, don't do this, don't do that. You sit in rows, right? We, these are, these are things that cause us to like, that's not how we normally function as human beings. 
Some people are more easily conditioned to those environments. But that's not really how we operate or who we are. Study this thing and now recite it back to me. That's not always how we learn or how we create. But this is how this was always done. And we as human beings, we have the capacity for thought, for imagination, for ideas. So that means that we need to create environments where new ideas, new systems can be evolved and built upon while honoring tradition, but not getting stuck in it. But these systems, oftentimes, in their most egregious sense, were built in order to break people. That was the point. So it's not like, oh man, why are these things hurt? That's what they were designed to do. Some systems were designed in order to do the very things that they were meant to do. So the future has already been born. Talking about the now generation, I want you to think about your own self, but also think about the communities around you. We have youth that exist, teens, young adults, and this idea that a lot of what we do is about making people cogs in a machine versus saying you are a vital organism in an ecosystem. So if everyone is just one of many, we need to become this thing, this thing, and do it the same way. Assembly line type vibes, which is really awkward. We know where it comes from, the Industrial Revolution, but don't dismiss that the future is happening now. So how do we embed and create environments that are really trying to put generations together and spaces to start building now instead of saying, yeah, one day when you grow up, because that's why that question, it's like really cute. What do you want to be when you grow up? It plants this idea in our mind that there's like a point in which we quote unquote grow up, but also we start to associate what we do with our identity. And if you don't have a thing, then you don't matter. We don't talk enough about how the things also change. Oh, I changed careers 20 times. It's like, you know, we don't talk about those things. This is pressure. Why? Because we're trying to feed this larger entity and this larger system that you need to produce in order to feed the larger entity. So think of yourself as a vital organism and think about those around you. A couple more thoughts. I'm always proposing that we break the industrial mindset. It worked for a time because we were in a, our country was in a space that it needed to be in. Things happened. But we're really hurting right now because a lot of spaces where we need innovation, we need forward thinking, we need more agricultural understandings of what it means to cultivate environments, we're still trying to do the carbon copy thing. It's really harmful. And I believe it's our responsibility to think critically about where we see industrial thinking and how we can reshape and reframe it to transform how we relate to one another. Because it goes back to the, well, how we think about the world, what we assign value to. We live in a capitalistic society, right? Value is money. I'm, oh, what? You're doing, you're studying what? What kind of money, like, what do you, how are you gonna make money doing that? And most of the time people asking that, they don't have that much money in the bank account. <laughs> isn't it weird? Everybody's always asking these questions, what are you gonna do with that? I'm like, well, what are you gonna do? I don't know, what are you gonna do, right? Because our values are all on high production quantity values instead of the quality of the thing. So breaking the industrial mindset. So in a literal sense, we're talking about our environment, thinking about clean air and how people breathe, but we have to do this in our ecosystems and our environments and what we create. How do you clean the air? First, you have to understand what's toxic, what's hindering people from progressing or from being their true selves, what's hindering us in arts and creativity and in our industry from actually operating at the highest level. Because right now, the art is not the value. It's now about monetary value. And then when we associate certain ideas with certain types of people, it harms us from actually creating the space 
to evolve, to progress, and to actually achieve diversity. A lot of our spaces don't have diversity because we have certain assumptions. I'll give you an example. A lot of times right now, people are apprehensive to hire certain people, person of color, for instance, because they don't, I don't want tokenism. I don't want to just bring you in just because you're black. And the problem with that thinking at times is that we assume, not we, because I'm, I'm not a part of the group. They, let's be honest, it's not me, I don't, I don't do this, right? But there's a large assumption that, well, if I bring on somebody just because they're black, they may not, like, they're probably not qualified, right? It's, it's just this other assumption with it that the large amount of people that look like that are probably like, they're not qualified. And so we create these back-end narratives that feed our really small, innocent statements. It's like, oh, I don't want to bring him on just because, you know, yeah, he's black, but, you know, it's like, qualified to do what? Right? It's clean the air. And so, specifically in, in my field of industry, and I think about the intersectionality between all of them, because I think they should all work together, so whatever field you work in or whatever you do matters. But since we're talking about arts, I believe that it's an opportunity for those of us that are working in arts and industries that are really arts-based and creativity-based. We should be the ones most fit to pioneer, engineer, and cultivate new types of ecosystems. Why? Because the nature of what we do is about creating in a more forward sense. Even though scientists do too, right? you're researching and you're trying to create a process in order to get results. But there's something deeper happening in the arts, right? It's about healing, it's about processing, it's about identification, it's also about unification, right? Which is why, you know, an artist can tour the world with their music, or you can play a film anywhere, but, sorry, the top researcher at Harvard giving a presentation at some random art, like park, ain't nobody going to that. <laughs> I don't understand what you're talking about, right? Because I didn't actually do well in that subject. But the idea is that arts more naturally unifies because it's our most human expression when we're tapping into both the intellect and the emotions, the marriage of the two. So wherever you are, you can think about how our diversity should just come not because we're trying to achieve diversity, but because if we're just trying to do what we're supposed to do, it should by default lead us into pioneering the future. Because that's what we're meant to do, to create. So, an expression I want to give you today is practical healing. When we think about action versus performative activism, we have to first acknowledge that there has been radical harm done to people, to communities, to individuals, and that we have to practically heal. So if you're a person of influence or you have power in an entity or an organization, you can facilitate some of these things thinking about relationally-based work and creative environments. What does it look like to think about the importance of human-to-human -human relationships? What happens when a professor doesn't just care about the subject or the grade, but invests in a mutual relationship with students? Because it's not just I have something to give you, you have something to give me. It goes both ways, and that there's an enrichment what happens when we think about creating meaningful experiences? Talk about transformation, you can't transform when you're in the same environment around the same types of people consistently. What happens when you create opportunities for yourself as an individual first, but then others? And sometimes that's the issue. A lot of people are trying to mix and create stuff institutionally, but they're not going on the personal journey of making sure that your life and your head and your heart is diverse. That's where the action comes in. And prioritizing safety, what happens when we start to care about the safety of others? And being honest about what that looks like. And this is all centering around this idea of power. So what do we make of power? And an, an expression that I'd like to lead with is to empower is to power. If you have any sort of power, influence, authority, sometimes in a practical position, when you empower others, that actually fuels your power. 
And so many people are so anxious to hold on to their power, their title, their position, that they don't realize that the greatest power is actually to give power and to strengthen and to allow others to flourish in the context. So as we think about these institutional spaces, a lot of policies, procedures are meant to hold power. A practical way you can do that is to think about nonprofits, board limits, term limits, you know what I'm saying? It's like things like that to rotate. So the last kind of couple of thoughts I want to give you before we have some discussion is in your organizations, in your spaces, in your classrooms, in your friendships, and everywhere, we can think more deeply about embedding advocacy into the work that you're doing. It's not separate. A lot of these conversations about, okay, we want to have a separate thing to talk about diversity, how we can advocate for people who are da 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 da. It's like, no, embed it into the work. What does that look like? For instance, say you have a, a desire to see more young black girls in music law. You don't have to create a separate work in order to do that. Create some policies and pipeline and pathways, which I'll end with talking about, to be able to foster and to nurture that diversity earlier. So now I have my organization and my entity. What we do is we partner with a local school, an elementary through high school, and we run seminars, show them things, talk with them, internships. These are practical ways. You fill your spaces with who you want to see in the future, but you do it now. Don't wait until it's like, oh, well, I'm looking at the job pool. And it's, I mean, we hired her, and she's the only one. She's the only one. Because the imaginations and the, and the worth is being killed much earlier. So we have to go deeper. So if we're talking about promoting representation, what we see matters and who we see matters. So it's not tokenism. To me, go further down the stream to see how can we capture imaginations earlier. So rethinking pipelines and pathways. And this is a lot of the work that I do at my job and just in everyday life. When we talk about pipelines, one of the most famous ones we talk about right now is the school of prison pipeline, right? There are other pipelines that we can create. So what are you doing in your position to create pathways and pipelines that are not necessarily even organized things? They can just be the way that you live. What if you, as an entrepreneur, as an organizational leader, as a professor, even as a student, took time to feel like, hmm, who in my circle is in a different generation? Hey, every Thursday, come to work with that's creating a pipeline and a pathway. This is how we diversify the workforce. It's not always doing it where it's happening. Go, go backwards. Think about initiatives you can begin, things you can start, and you don't have to have graduated if you're a student. You can do those things now. If you're at University of Hartford, maybe. Get connected with Hartford. Do some research. Who's a teacher that you can maybe connect with and say, hey, we'd love to just come hang out with some students and just talk a little bit about this, this, this and that. Because the realm of possibilities is important. Developing and preserving youth, both internally, but also in a practical sense. How do we give those things? So it was mentioned in my bio, and I wanted to give you these ideas first and then share a couple of brief things that we can talk about more in the Q&A of the spaces that I occupy. But how we're embedding these things is in a range of ways. At Writer's Block specifically, I'm now president of the board, but I used to run the organization. It's based in London. It's really anchored in this idea of youth empowerment by giving teens, youth, students the tools to create their own theatrical productions thoroughly from scratch around social issues that they care about. And they do everything from write, act, direct, costumes, lights, promote, design, conduct research on the different topics, whether it be on gun violence, immigration in America, racism, oppression of different kinds. And those types of spaces are really about not balancing power, but surrendering. What does it look like to create space for the imagination to flourish 
into practical action. The work of Connected Office of the Arts, a lot of it is anchored and rooted in developing the workforce, but we're exploring ways now to think about children. The children are where it's at, it's the kids, because without talking about that now, we don't realize that a lot of these other ecosystems we create are detrimental. Kids are coming, and some of you may have been there. You have ecosystems at home that are just terrorizing your imagination. You can't think about the world. There's no realm of possibility. Or your schools. And a lot of my teachers, as I said, would be surprised that I'm here. But some of it is because they didn't even know that this sort of thing was possible. Because we only feed these like four pathways. Like you can do this, 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 that. And it's like, okay, well, I don't fit those. Okay, well, you're going to fail. Or you're going to end up locked up. You're gonna... So what happens when, when we get more knowledge and we just start spreading information? Like, hey, did you know that this person does this thing? Teachers who bring in guest speakers are superheroes to me. Because you're like, wow, I met that person and they do this. I didn't know that that was a thing. I really like music. I didn't know I could manage an artist or I could take photos and do album covers or that I, my skills from drawing could lead to animation. I didn't know that. My teacher just told me, if you study art in college, you'll have a good time and then you'll be broke. <laughs> right? Even this myth of the starving artist, I don't know any artists personally that are living out of their car. Not that that doesn't happen, but the way we hype it up, I actually know more employed artists than I do engineers. <laughs> It's true, it's like, we have to change these narratives. And then through the art that I create, it's about that as well. So I wanna end this piece with this statement. Difference in the world can make a world of a difference. So as we continue this conversation, not just today, but throughout the rest of this festival, and in your own lives and in your classrooms, thinking about the power of difference but difference without vision and an actionable plan would just be different for the sake of difference. But we have to really reimagine our spaces, think about what kind of ecosystem, down to the values we hold, practical ways that we can embed them and transform them, and then we'll see a transformation in ourselves, in our environments, in our spaces, in our world because the answers that we need to the greatest problems in the world are actually possessed within human imaginations and minds. But they fail to ever get to come together to create because our ecosystems are continuing to strip away what makes you you. And so we have to change that where we are, but also deal with the now generation to make sure that we can save as many men as possible so they can break through and then we can create a different kind of world. Thank you. So I believe now. So we have a deal of time for Q and A. So we'll just open up the. Floor. No pressure. Um, you can make a statement as well. You probably have to be pretty loud. I don't have the extra microphone to walk around the audience. But questions. No pressure. I don't feel bad. If you don't have any, it's fine. Maybe I'm not the right one to ask. <laughs> you can go Google it later. I don't know. So I, I have I have a question. Okay. I may have an answer. You may have an answer. If I don't, I'll tell you transparently. Okay. So for our, our audience members that aren't as intimately familiar with uh, Connecticut Office of the Arts, maybe if you can speak a little bit about the mission of the, the Office of the Arts and kind of how they go about this empowerment. Yeah, yeah, for yeah. sure. So the Connecticut Office of the Arts, all states have arts agencies that facilitate everything from like funding to information to help spread the arts and arts advocacy throughout the state. In Connecticut, our Office of the Arts is under the Department of Economic and Community Development, so we're in the government entity. Some states have an, a state agency, but it's a nonprofit. It functions different. But what we primarily do is we fund. So you go on our website, there are a lot of grants for individual artists, nonprofit organizations, so on and so forth. We curate and, and lead events, conferences, workshops, just to really help spread and make sure that access to arts is available to as many as possible. But we mainly do that because our team is small. We can only do but so much. 
we mainly do that by supporting the work that people are already doing. Because we're not here to compete with other entities. So organizations that have done amazing things, be able to give them money and say, hey, keep doing what you're doing, or try to find new and exciting ways to do that. So there's a lot of ways that we do that through programs like the Arts Workforce Development, which is an internship program that we've run for years, and placing lots of different folks in 10 week summer internships with hands-on arts experience, and not thinking about it like, oh, I'm an intern, I'm gonna go get somebody and some coffee. It's more like, no, I'm gonna understand what a box office manager does at a theater, or I'm gonna work in this nonprofit and see how to write grants. And it's really just about empowering that way. So those are, that's a little bit, the website probably you know, gives you more information if you want that. Questions from our audience? Yeah. So thank you for the perspectives that you shared today. So I'm thinking about my 17 year old son and I feel like what you presented today is like where he is in, in life. Uh, he's brilliant, but he just doesn't fit into using your words, the ecosystems that have been created for him. So where did it click for you? Yeah, I think I've had multiple clicks. Okay. Uh, fortunately, I grew up in a home where I was fed a lot of life, so my parents didn't, they didn't feed into the other narratives that were being imposed on me. So I was always reminded of who I really was, and they were really open to hearing what I was saying. Um, and they would advocate for me, right? So I had a very active, engaged father who, you know, teachers or people push it too far, he would be at the school. Um, set up meetings, and so my mom, all my teachers, everybody knew her, and so she was constantly there and active and engaged. And so I think at a young age it clicked that I knew like, okay, this isn't working for me. The one thing from there is I had little sparks of light along the way in the forms of like some teachers and mentors who would just feed me, right, certain ideas. I had one, one teacher in high school who he really, one day really understood I think because he saw me perform and do something, right? Because one of the big issues was when I started doing music and art stuff in my high school, all those classes were pass fail and everything else you get a grade for. So it didn't hold the same weight, but he saw me and he was one of my teachers that was like, yo, <laughs> he was, I was so irritated with me all the time because I wasn't doing well in his class. And, but he saw me at a thing that I did and he pulled me aside and he's like, wow, he's like, you really like it. You really have something. Like, I was really touched by what you did today. And that was like a, a, one of those clicks to where like he didn't necessarily say, I believe in you, you know, whatever. But it was more of like, wow, that was amazing. And throughout that time, I got a chance to just explore that more. And then friends and people that I met along the way. But really a major click for me was in college. Uh, I got a chance to have, I was in a small class with a particular professor who, he was supposed to cancel the class because it wasn't enough people that signed up for it, but he was tenured. And you know, if you're a professor, you're tenured, you don't care. You break the rules. So there's only three of us uh, in this essay writing class, because I studied English literature in college, and, and I did like a thesis on black superheroes and masculinity and stuff like that. And he like nurtured me in that space, and he just would ask me a lot of questions, like what do you want to do? Like what do you, where do you see yourself? And he would feed me like names of people that I could research. Look into this person, listen to this person's music, or watch this or watch that. And the more I started seeing people that resonated with me, the more it helped. Because even my parents at times felt limited because they're like, yeah, we rock, support you, but I don't know what that looks like. But even their faith increased when I started to show them people that I started to learn about. So even with your son, not that you asked like, for like, that sort of like support, no, I but, but I would encourage you to um, continue to pick his brain up to like at the core what things is he like or what is he feeling, and then start finding people that do things like that, and start to just give him role models because I had ended up having a lot of role models from a distance that were doing things. I was like, oh. Yeah, they do that, but I want to do that, plus what this person does, 
because exposure and representation is so important. So not neglecting to put those figures in front of people. And you know the expression, it takes a village to raise a child. I think our village is now virtual. So it wasn't just like my family members, but I also had people that I still haven't met to this day that I got a chance to, to, to roll with. So I mean, I, was that, is that, is that helpful? That Thank okay, you. Cool. Yeah, and we can tell it afterwards if you want to you know, talk more specifically if you can, because I would love to know about it, because I'm sure he's, I'm sure he's dope. Yeah. Uh, I love that. Thank you. Anyone else? Yeah, go ahead. Yeah, I was going to ask the same question you asked, too, who are some of the mentors or sparks in your life, but you just answered it pretty well. <laughs> so thanks for asking that. So my follow-up question would be, um, at Connecticut Office of the Arts, do you have or do you support an organization that does create some sort of mentoring network or to sort of share, create this kind of ecology ecosystem that you're talking about? Yeah, there's a few different organizations, some that are like more recent, others that have been around for a bit throughout the state that are spreading a lot of work. One of the challenges right now, I think it's always been a challenge, is that Connecticut whether you've been in Connecticut for a short while or a long while, there's not a lot of centrality or, or, or connectivity. So everyone's kind of doing work and things in silos. And so there's, there are a couple organizations that we fund that specifically work with um, young girls and providing them spaces to get arts mentorship in, in their communities and beyond. But we're trying to create one of my dreams right now and visions is uh, to create a theater education conference that brings together theater practitioners, artists, and others of the like together to be able to nurture and mentor students in their spaces in new, exciting ways. And so those types of things are brewing, but we need more of it. And I think that it's not just on organizations that specialize in that. It's not on them alone. I think a lot of our organizations should just have that embedded. Right? As I was kind of saying, to me it makes sense. If we talk about we want to see diversity, we want to see this, we want to see that, why not create as a part of your business model a way to, to pipeline in a positive way different folks to be able to plug them in. Because I do think that we need mentors and we need that connectivity to be able to be sharpened. But not everyone gets a chance. Like I was grateful I went to college and I had professors and people that nurtured and cultivated me, but you shouldn't have to go there alone to be able to find that. So there are organizations, but we need more, and we need other people to be bold and stand up and be like, yeah, we want this to be a part of what we do, though. So I have, I have another question. I, I'm wondering if the answer you may have just given in response to uh, Professor uh, Pierce's question that is, you've been on both sides, and you're still on both sides. You're an artist, but also an administrator within an organization. I'm curious, as the artist, before you started working for Connecticut Office of the Arts, what did you sort of recognize as a major hurdle or impediment in your own part? And what have you now undertaken in your official role to say, hey, I think I can change that? Yeah, that is a great question. So I think it's been like multifold. I think I'll take like the theater side of me was I was not exposed to enough tools and resources and space to be able to create or to to learn in really active ways. And so that's why we're trying to create this conference, right? To shift what's happening in theater education as a music artist. You know, your music programs at school or even in communities are about like, oh yeah, you can play in the band or you can do this and just kind of figure it out. But you're never taught legal things, right? Or, or business practices or even seeing like how to make a sustainable life. So the other thing that we're, that we're doing is we started this event series and we have one coming up called The Talking Artist. And we're going to be having in-person events that will be recorded and shared later, but we're bringing in different creatives from different disciplines to give these, not quite TED Talks, but interview style talks to really provide tools and resources and inspiration to artists of that discipline to really understand both the creative side of how to strengthen and be inspired in that way,
but also how to file certain types of paperwork um, to become an LLC to create an actual business model, right? Because as individual artists, you don't think of yourself as a business because you're not told that. You just think you're just kind of this floating individual versus like, oh no, I'm actually, I'm a business entity. And so how do I govern myself like that or create business models and practices? And so we're trying to do things like that to just help folks understand. And once again, I feel like doing that at earlier ages, like if I was in high school and we just even did one class or workshop, I'm like, hey, everyone in here who thinks that they want to go into music and not just teach us music theory or you can stay after school and be in music, I think that would have made a world of difference because most times people are not learning certain things until you're like in your 20s, 30s, and you're like, what? I don't know what told me. It's just like a simple cheat code of like, hey, by the way, you can learn these notes, but like, you know, you should protect yourself. <laughs> like, I don't know, <laughs> like, it's just something simple, right? Um, or, you know, this is like, it's just the business side. So I think that's like some of the main things we're doing. Anything else? No pressure. But all the pressure? Ask something, okay. okay. Online? <laughs> we don't have an app yeah. chat. So I'm I'm teaching. Teaching. I'm obviously, I was teasing. Yeah, yeah, stop stop <laughs> but we will have one on Thursday. Cool. So our, if there are no questions, I'd like to uh, thank Fulton Harris for coming out today. I thank thank you, you for being here. Fulton, you're sticking around for a second. You got yeah, so I mean, he's, no, I, I don't. Okay. I, can just, I can just tell you, we can follow each other on social media or something like that. Or I have a website too. Okay. Yeah, so you can stay connected there. It's just coltonharris.com, but with a K. Colton with a K. And Harris with an H. <laughs> okay. And while I have you all here captive, I'm going to remind you we're having programming all week long. Tomorrow, um, we're going to have another dynamic speaker, Adrian uh, Jefferson from New Haven uh, Arts, Culture, and Tourism Council. She's going to come up and speak tomorrow about the intersections of policy, community, and the arts. Um, on Wednesday, our Jackie McLean fellow, Mr. Bowling Williams, is going to present on uh, how can you be an artist and not reflect the times. It is theorized in black music and uh, performance. On Thursday, it will be a webinar. I'm sorry, uh, tomorrow and Wednesday are going to be over Wild, same time. Uh, Thursday will be a webinar. Ms. Kalita Jones from Arts Consulting Group is going to present on um, equitable, accessible, and sustainable practices in admissions for conservatories. So those are our lectures for the week. You have programs in your chairs because we also have four very dynamic um, black composers. Um, Kevin Day, Carlos Simon, Omar Thomas, and Valerie Coleman are all here and their works are being performed uh, by the Wind Ensemble and the Heart Prince Symphony Orchestra Thursday, I'm sorry, Friday and Saturday night in Lincoln Theater. Everything's free, it's open to the public. So I welcome you all to come back, please, and uh, bring 20 people with you when you're done. That'd be awesome. Yeah, no 20 people. No, please come to the other ones. I, I will advocate for everyone that I know. Adrian is a legend. She's one of my dear friends. And Kalita is incredible. But everyone else is too. I'm just going to shout them out because I know them. I'm sure everyone else is amazing. And let's give it up for this man right here. For me.